Kafcon. Um, I talk today, I'm Nicolas, so co-founder and CTO of Ledger, a manufacturer of fine hardware wallet. Um, my talk today will be about hardening smart contracts with hardware security. Uh, an alternative title could be how to build, how to design a platform to design hardware wallets on different kind of secure hardware. So let's move forward. So first, uh, why, do you, why do we need to secure smart contracts? Because uh, smart contracts themselves are extremely secure. They are running into the Ethereum uh, um, VM blockchain. I mean, they are secured by the consensus is securing smart contract. But there are some nasty things that could happen around the edges. Uh, if we look at the right thing, um, first smart contract can receive data from external sources. So here, this external sources is uh, Petya from Delphi, uh, who, as you know, is telling the future. So some people are calling that uh, oracles. I decided to stop doing that after getting some nasty gram from a database uh, designing company, but you get the idea. So if they are not trusted, the smart contract can act and perform some mistakes. On the other hand, smart contracts are interacting with users who are uh, holding keys. Uh, the generic user PC is not extremely secure, uh, also as you can see here. So we need to secure key protection. Here, we have two items to secure, and we'll see how secure hardware can help with that. So what kind of threats can we get uh, against the edges? First, we can consider malware. So we have very dumb malware, which will just steal private keys, or smarter malware that can manipulate contracts or just feed bad data to the user. First, uh, then we have physical attacks. So we can have passive physical attacks, which, which are extremely powerful. If the algorithms are not properly defined, an attacker can manage by looking at the chip power consumption or uh, significative uh, things, I mean, changing with the chip, can retrieve private keys and can basically steal data from the executing process. Then physical attacks requiring access to the chip itself, which can be leveraged um, to change the behavior of the chip by performing some glitching attacks. So here, people might think that glitching is going to open something. Uh, glitching is a bit more complex. It will change the way the process is running, basically. So it's still extremely powerful. It's not easy to get right. But if you manage to glitch an item, uh, if you manage to glitch a physical device the right way, you can also extract keys. So we have to consider all those threats when dealing with secure hardware. So secure hardware here will be bringing an isolated environment to run the different applications. So we want secure hardware that let us execute code, otherwise we can't do much. Uh, we want ideally secure hardware that is physically resistant, so secure hardware on which it's hard to extract data. Uh, we also want secure hardware to give us proof of execution on the platform. So when we run code on secure hardware, we must be able to be able to prove to an external party that the platform is healthy, so that the platform has not been broken into, and that the code running into the hardware has been running into the right platform. And ideally, if depending on the hardware we are running on, we might want to we might want we might want to strengthen the cryptographic primitives uh, to prevent the passes, to prevent the passive attacks we have been talking about before. So when considering secure hardware, people do not feel comfortable about them uh, because, of, because of binary blobs and NDAs around secure hardware. Um, but the general idea here is that today we don't have any kind of open hardware really available. If you look closely into the different architecture of the hardware that you are using, you, you never fully own your hardware. I mean, at least for all generic, for all general purpose computers available today. On your CPU, people can modify the microcode of your CPU, so the way it behaves. If we are using an STM32, which is a very common open uh, microcontroller used for hardware wallets, you don't really know how the chip is behaving itself as well, because it has critical parts regarding to the related to the security of the chip itself. So I am taking a pragmatic approach about that. I'm basically considering that Secure hardware is considered to be best of class today to protect data. And if it's available, and if we think about the different threats, and if we try to limit them, it's still safe to use it, and it's still, uh, open, it's still open enough. 
And on a small point, I mean, if you are using uh, if you are using an Intel CPU today and you don't want to use SGX, uh, I would just remind you that you are already using the management engine, uh, which can do a lot of stuff behind your back. So if you are using the management engine for the bad parts, you can also use it for the good parts. Uh, small, very quick history of secure hardware. So the general idea here is that secure hardware is getting more open over time. So initially, everything started with smart cards in the IT. Uh, smart cards were not very powerful and were not easy to use. You had to buy a specific reader to use them. They were absolutely not internet friendly. In 2005, Ubico innovated with something more sophisticated on which you, uh, you could bring user presence and you didn't need a reader, but still the chip was not very powerful uh, and not extremely open. And we have seen really a new set of secure hardware coming uh, with cryptocurrencies because um, hardware wallets have been designed to be able to work in an extremely hostile environment in which malware could change things on the user computer and the hardware wallet had to always operate properly, otherwise people would be losing money. So I'm considering hardware wallets today uh, as the next evolution in smart cards, because they are really smart cards designed for an hostile environment and for the internet. If we look now at the history of generic hardware, so why secure hardware is getting more open, uh, generic hardware is getting more secure. So they will meet at some point, <laughs> that's the idea. So here, uh, initially, if we, if we want to consider the generic CPUs, uh, ARM introduced Trust Zone, which are a set of very low-level primitives that you can use to uh, basically create operating systems that will isolate applications and create a normal world and a secure world in which secure applications can execute without being interrupted by the operating system. Um, Intel did the same thing a bit later. The platform is more rich, so while Trust Zone only provides primitives, uh, Int SGX is providing a set of APIs that you can use to run any kind of application without writing the operating system yourself. And then a bit later, we have seen some evolutions of Trust Zone and mostly Trust Zone coming with hardware components uh, optimizing cryptographic primitives that we have been talking about before. And one interesting chip, if you want to look at that, is the, is, uh, the latest chip, uh, including BLE from Nordic, uh, which, has a Trust Zone, which has Trust Zone and a cryptographic accelerator. So those chips are extremely close to secure elements today. They don't have exactly the same uh, physical uh, properties. I mean, we adding resistance to hardware attacks and proving the origin of the chip, but otherwise they are, they are extremely close. So now what, do we, what is a hardware wallet and what do we want to build if we are splitting the different parts of a hardware wallet into an architecture that I will call the transaction interface. So the transaction interface will interact with secret data, uh, which is basically uh, the seed of the user if we are considering uh, if we are considering keys and if we are considering deriving keys. Several applications will be interacting with those keys. We don't want those applications to interact directly with the secrets, otherwise they can steal the secrets. And we want to isolate the applications from each other. So applications have to call the transaction interface over a secure path, which won't reveal the secret and will only let them run a specific set of, of algorithms. And further, we can lock the applications on several properties. For example, we can lock them on an HD derivation path, which means that here, if an application gets compromised, the only derivation path that can leak is a specific is a path specific to this application. So here, uh, I'm referring to hierarchical deterministic wallets, uh, which are getting used uh, now uh, significantly, I mean, for, for Ethereum, and have been used in Bitcoin for, for a long time. But we can generalize the concept for all set of keys. Uh, how do we, so what kind of components do we need to build the transaction interface on secure hardware? We need to build the isolation first, so because if we want to run several applications together, we need to isolate them, and we need to isolate the part interacting with secret data from the applications. Then we need to guarantee secure storage. Uh, we need to guarantee a secure implementation of the cryptographic primitives, so referring to the uh, passive attacks that we talked about before. 
and then uh, we need to make sh we need to provide a way for the external party to verify that the platform is legitimate and that an application running on the platform is legitimate and on top of that because we are running in a world with smart contracts uh, we want to provide a way to authenticate this on chain so typically we want to be able to prove on chain that we are running the right application on the right platform and now we'll see how to implement those different components on different hardware and the consequences so first, uh, why are we designing a transaction interface rather than running with uh, a set of different applications? The point is we are saving time by doing that rather than just uh, letting each provider design his own set of applications. Uh, as we've seen before, formal validation is quite complicated, so that's just an example. If we want a formal validation of a secure hardware, it's better to do it on a common interface than to duplicate the work on a set of applications. So here, the right parts are the critical parts. The transaction interface is critical, and all the steps are that the other, that the other application would call, which are still executing in the secure world, uh, are protected by the transaction interface, so you don't need to spend too much time in that case validating them, because the platform will already guarantee that they can't leak, uh, thanks to the isolation properties. If uh, we want to implement that on ARM, so that's a regular, the most regular use case which will be completely native, uh, we can use the native properties of ARM, C of ARM CPUs to do that. So we can isolate the secrets using memory management unit or memory protection unit. And when the calls that will be uh, done over from the application to the transaction interface can be directly mapped to ARM service calls. So here, the architecture is extremely close to the first one. We are just replacing all the calls and all the isolation by native ARM properties, and the applications themselves are native. We don't need to run a VM when we are using ARM, because the hardware is allowing, is allowing us to perform the isolation by itself. Now, let's consider HTX. So HTX is kind of different. We don't have access, we don't work close to the metal, we can't really isolate enclaves, so enclaves being application running on HGX from each other. We don't have either an attestation scheme that can run on chain, so the attestation scheme on HGX is Intel proprietary and we have to call a server on Intel side to guarantee that the platform is legitimate. So in this case, uh, one simple use case that I suggest is to use a virtual CPU. So it might look complex to use a virtual CPU, but thankfully uh, there are things like Moxie, uh, which are open source, already very easy to test and already almost proven, I would say. So it has been used by different projects in the Bitcoin space. And why would we use that rather than the EVM? The most, uh, I mean, the easiest reason is that if we want to guarantee portability and easy portability between different uh, secure environments, targeting C is a good call because when we are, when we will be working on ARM, uh, we will have native isolation, and here we simulate the native isolation by running with a virtual CPU. So, of course, well, that's just a suggestion, I would say. This architecture is completely open for, for uh, comments, and, well, don't hesitate to, to push for some other ideas. Now, uh, secure storage. So, how are we going to handle secure storage depending on the platforms? If we are running on our own platform natively, then we don't have any problem because we can just store things natively on the platform. If we are running on a host uh, on which we can't store anything, which is an example for Enclaves and HTX, we have to be a little bit more creative in this case. So one way to do that is every time we want to use secret data, we can encrypt it by a key which is owned by the application running into HTX, running into the secure environment. We can store this on the host because then uh, it's not dangerous because this, this, I mean, this blob is encrypted and cannot be, cannot be used by the host. And when we want to use it, we will just pass it back to the enclave. We can also choose to bind the data to different items. So we can bind it to the interface itself, we can bind it to the device, or we can bind it to a specific application. So we have all kinds of granularity in the way we isolate uh, secrets from other applications, even when running on an enclave. Uh, we still have some, some problems if we want to consider secure storage on enclave, so on which we can't store things natively. Uh, typically, anti-replay is a critical feature. 
if we want to implement a pin counter and we don't have anti-replay, it's not going to work because then people can just push you the same counter over and over again and you just can't do that. So one way to overcome this, this limitation is to use monotonic counters. Uh, monotonic counters would be counter that on, can only go forward and this is guaranteed by hardware. So in this case, we would use a monotonic counter, put it in the object reference, store the value, increase it when we want to change it and it's fine because this can't be replayed. Uh, this can't be replayed depending on the condition we have for the implementation of monotonic counters on the platform. So here again, keeping in mind that you have to consider all threads when implementing something, you want to verify typically if there is a reset condition for monotonic counter and how that would work. Now, something else to consider uh, specifically for SGX. Let's say you want to migrate data from one enclave to another. Uh, you have to consider if you want to lock your secrets to your applications or lock your secrets to your issuer. If you lock to your application, then secure, I mean, security-wise, it's quite safe because if the application is modified, you are losing secrets. But it's not that nice for the end user because then you have to repersonalize everything. If you lock to the issuer, Everybody can update the application, but if you lose the issuer key, then you are going to be, you are going to be able to compromise all user data by just de deploying a wrong enclave. So here again, you have a trade-off to perform between security and usability, and think carefully about it. Uh, now, regarding the implementation of cryptographic primitives, you have basically two choices. Uh, you can use cryptographic primitives uh, given to you by the platform with guarantees that they are going to behave very well and they are going to resist all kind of, uh, all kind of side channel attacks, or you can use open source crypto. Uh, history has proven so far that it's better to use open source crypto, so if you have been following security news, uh, inf an Infineon library has some issues recently. So here, uh, well, we have good typical choices to implement several cryptographic primitives. Uh, coming from Bitcoin, we have LibSecP, 256K1, and um, CTAES, so for AES. And we have other open source libraries for different kind of cryptos which have been tested against side channel attacks and which are reliable. Uh, I, would consider to, I would consider to exert extreme caution when picking a, a cryptographic library because there are a lot of open source cryptographic libraries when, uh, where these attacks have not been considered. But uh, thanks to different cryptocurrency projects, they have already picked some good libraries for us. So we can use that in Enclave as well. Now the proof of execution, if we want to prove that something has been running uh, as on the trusted platform and on the blockchain, the easiest way to do that is to just include the hash of the application into a primitive that we will call to let an application sign a message. We can do that because the isolation engine is knowing which application is running and so can intercept a call, insert the hash of the application in the middle and work further with that. So by implementing this, uh, we have something that's extremely easy to verify on chain because it's just a signature. And typically this has, always, this has already been implemented by our clients and there is an example you can, you can, you can check. On SGX, the way we will do that is we will go through one step. Uh, we will call IAAS, so we will call the Intel attestation service at some point because that's necessary to initiate uh, the chain of trust. And then we will continue the chain of trust from, from ourselves. So in the end, we end up with applications that we can verify on chain, even if they are running on an SGX enclave with an attestation which is not supposed to run on chain. But we might still want from time to time to check the health of the platform because the state of an enclave can change over time. Typically, if there are bugs or, or exploits, uh, that's the case today. There is a bug that's going to be patched uh, by Intel uh, shortly. So we, we, we have a system that we can verify on chain. We still have to pay some attention on how we are going to patch it. Um, several use cases we can have with all those systems. So we can first this decide to replace hardware wallets and virtualize hardware wallets. 
But to do that, we first need to have a trusted display and trusted input, because one of the key parts of hardware wallets is not lying to the user when displaying something and waiting for the user input before actually performing an action. If we want to do that, we need specific primitives that might be not implemented by all platforms. Uh, typically, on SGX, we would need uh, the trusted display is called PTD for protected protection display, transaction display, sorry. We would need to have this implemented if we want to have a user wallet which is similar to a consumer product. We can still perform some, we have some mitigations if we don't have PTD, typically we can use two enclaves to have one acting as a secure screen and the other one b binding to the other. But yeah, that's kind of a hack and not extremely comfortable if you tell to users that you are going to make their life easier, but still require, need to have two devices uh, to work properly. Another uh, use case, which is probably more uh, useful and easier to deploy in that case, is to use uh, to create a usage-specific hardware wallet. So a hardware wallet that would lock for specific contracts, for specific addresses, uh, for specific limits or quotas that you want to implement on the um, on the system. So that's easy to deploy even if you don't have a trusted input. Uh, question is, you might wonder why this is better than a smart contract implementation that could do all this by itself. So first, if you want to deploy this on a device, it's a great way to make sure that your device keys uh, won't be stolen to do something else, which is still a critical issue. I mean, even if the smart contract is enforcing things. And then you can create more flexible update rules. If you want to update a smart contract today, either you have to think about it uh, before creating creating it, or you would have to empty it and transfer its funds elsewhere. So doing that with hardware might be more convenient in, in many use cases. Uh, you can also use a service to create uh, external services that you can verify. So the random source, the random uh, oracle is an example, also from Oracle's, creating a random source and verifying that the random has been generated by a trusted platform. And finally, uh, so speaking about those architecture, um, we have an implementation running a, a prototype that you can already play with. So I'm taking all kind of suggestions about it. Uh, today, there is an implementation working on SGX. There will be one working on ARM um, shortly next year. So it's heavy work in progress, just to let you know, we don't have yet an Ethereum wallet available, but you will find all cryptographic primitives. And if you want to start playing with it and then asking uh, some questions while I'm around, um, let's get the conversation started. Thanks.